Uh, we continue with Kathleen Rockland from uh, Boston University. Uh, her talk is entitled uh, Questions Posed by the Complex Architecture of Single Accents. Kathy. But it is. It's worth repeating. I uh, really thank the organizers for all their hard work. And with, with Nikos, Nikos, thank you for being Nikos. <laughs> okay, so um, I slightly changed the title, but it's really the same talk. Uh, Axons and Cortical Architectures. Uh, the, uh, I hope that you would agree with, whoops, <laughs> off to a flying start. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I think most of the work on, on, on connectivity, especially cortical connectivity, especially in the monkey, has uh, lately been, uh, and for a long time, with retrograde tracers. Uh, this is old, uh, well, it's actually a bi-directional tracer, uh, BDA. Uh, so we know a lot about laminar organization, a lot about numbers of neurons, and a lot about uh, a pattern, uh, and a lot we don't know. Uh, but uh, today I wanted to spend uh, time exclusively concentrating on uh, a series of axons, because I think that people are less familiar with the anterograde uh, patterns of, of axon. Uh, we know less about types for axons, although I will be using nomenclature. Uh, neurons have been increasingly easy to, uh, to analyze in terms of types, especially now with the uh, single-cell RNA-seq and clustering, etc. cetera. Uh, what we don't know about connections are, are, or still really don't know, are specializations in terms of areas and species, what happens between rodents and, and monkeys and, and, uh, and humans. Uh, biophysics, very little, though, uh, again, all of these things, the methods are getting increasingly better. Uh, so with super-resolution uh, microscopy, we can do things like look at per axons, uh, branch, what happens at branch points, what is the cytoskeleton like. Uh, uh, we certainly want to know more about postsynaptic groups and dynamics, something that we've heard time and time again uh, during these talks. And unfortunately, I will be saying nothing about this, but I hope that you can imagine, and I will refer to this in, in an imaginary, not a virtual reality, but an imaginary reality, unfortunately. Uh, what I will be emphasizing, however, is uh, what you can uniquely appreciate with axons, and that is simply the spatial organization. So this talk uh, is really very simple. It may be so simple that it becomes difficult, but uh, bear with me and I'll, I'll try to convey at least a few uh, points. Now, the first point actually is, is uh, with connections, uh, cortical connections, it's uh, popular to talk about feed forward and feed back, as we've already heard. Uh, and uh, I would, I'm going to use the, the terminology myself. Uh, the connections, the, the terms are based in part on different laminar organization, which I think you are familiar with. Uh, it has a very big uh, disadvantage, and that is the uh, nomenclature, <laughs> a simple thing. Uh, but we are still talking about area A goes to area B, and sometimes area B goes to area A, and I'm going to do that myself. Uh, but a quote that I like very much from, uh, I think, a group talking, uh, working with algebraic topology uh, had said, Diat dyadic relationships fail to accurately capture the rich nature, nature of the system's organization. And that's really one of the main points of this talk. So as I go through giving you example after example, um, keep in mind this issue of, uh, yes, this is our shorthand, this is our nomenclature, but uh, what really is going on is, is a, a very complex uh, network. Okay, I managed. <laughs> so in the 
um, in the rodent brain, for a long time, it has been relatively or comparatively easy to look at whole brain organization at the single axon level. Uh, so this is going back before 2012, but this is a, a very nice example slide. Uh, in the rat, this was done by now classic uh, <clears throat> tracer injection, uh, juxtacellular, you could also do intracellular, and visualize the whole axon arbor of these neurons. This is, uh, these are two neurons in the motor cortex in the, in the rat. And the uh, point is, is immediately obvious that you have widespread divergence. Uh, you also have, and probably a little less uh, obvious, is you have variability. The two neurons are not exact, and there probably are no two exact neurons. They will vary in terms of exactly where in these multiple targets they go. They will vary in terms of the size of arbor, number of boutons, and in terms, something I'll come back to at the end, and perhaps Kevin Martin will talk to us more about, the uh, intrinsic collateralization. So intrinsic is within the area of the cell soma, and extrinsic is all this other uh, stuff. Uh, this is a very labor-intensive uh, method, which has become, uh, it's still labor intensive, but more for the computers than for the individuals. And uh, that is one of the efforts uh, various people are doing, whole axon recon uh, reconstruction or analysis in the uh, rodents. Uh, this is from Genelia Farm with two populations of neurons, uh, GFP, labeled. And uh, I, I'm not going to go into details here, but uh, the key words are uh, very diverse and also uh, di divergent, divergent and diverse. Now, uh, some of this work was done in the monkey, especially in the subcortical areas, but relatively little in the in the cortical. Cortical uh, <clears throat> cortical uh, injections uh, of the tracers will typically give you a very dense field that you see here, and this would be. Uh, an example of the classical feed-forward neurons in V1 uh, layer 3, terminating in layer 4. But when we say terminating in layer 4, that is really an average of many, many uh, axons, which I will show you in the, in the next few slides, are very variable in terms of the number of arbors and the shape of arbor number of boutons. So this is uh, an example of a single, <coughs> single uh, axon. Here's the main arbor, uh, the trunk arbor, and then this is the detail that you can see. And you can, what can you do with that? Well, you can count, you can, you can look at size, you can look for variability. Um, let me go forward one. Okay, this is simply to repeat the methods here. This was uh, in, this is the monkey hemisphere. Uh, the examples I'm going to give you are all from the uh, visual pathway by and large uh, ventral. In a surgical procedure, we inject a tracer. In this case, it was be only one uh, viral was used, but this was a biotinylated dextranamine, which is an anterograde tracer. The uh, parent neuron is lost in the injection site, so we can only extrapolate from previous work that this would be uh, a retrograde tracers, that this is likely to be a layer three pyramid, for example. Uh, the technique involved going to the <clears throat> distal portion of the uh, projection site uh, and tracing back as far as possible, which often for V2 would be to the V1 injection. I'll show you that. Uh, for MT, very rarely, MTV5, very rarely would you be able to go back to the injection. Now, the organization of the talk is as a, uh, I intended it as a survey, uh, it's likely to come across as a little bit jumpy, and I apologize for that. But if you keep in mind, it's a survey where I want to make uh, redundantly the same points using uh, examples from feed-forward, pulvinocortical feedback, and a little bit intrinsic in collaterals. Now, I have to spend a little time on this slide, which I know is a busy slide, and I'll go through the conventions. This is older work, uh, so it's not in color. Um, it was done by reconstruction through uh, multiple sections. The brain would be, wait, the key here is keeping uh, serial sections, exact serial sections, and then uh, identifying your region of interest as you go from one uh, slide to the other. 
the, we heard uh, several talks and, and saw the importance of 3D analysis. That would certainly be true here. Uh, there is 3D, you just can't see it. Uh, it is collapsed in the 2D uh, dimension. If you can make out the numbers, and I think you probably cannot, every 20, every 20 numbers uh, you get one millimeter. So this is the z-axis is collapsed in that uh, 20 uh, type. Let me come back to the slide. I think I go one further. This is a little bit easier to see. Now, uh, here the injection was in V1. Here is the, uh, the <coughs> examples of uh, tissue sections. In this case, is they're, they're horizontal. Uh, the axon was picked up uh, just below the injection, and I'm marking the distal axon in all these cases by a double asterisk, a red asterisk. Uh, so we had the complete trajectory, and therefore we knew that there were no branches. That's not always the case, but here it is. Uh, and we were able to uh, follow the trajectory down into uh, MT uh, V5. This is an example of the uh, trajectory at the, at the blue asterisk. And um, so fine, this is the projection site, but what are the points here? Well, uh, if here you can see the numbers, and there are three, one, two, three um, distinct foci. They're about, uh, here's your scale bar, it's 200 to 500 microns. Uh, this is very diffuse, however, this one is 200 microns. And uh, this, is a very, this would be a very typical size for a cortical cortical arbor, 200 microns. Um, in the, with one exception, also very typical that you have multiple arbors here and here. Uh, unusual is that you have, for MTV5, there is consistently a, a third arbor, and that's not in, B, in layer four, but in layer six. So this is an axon that uh, we know from other work of other people, originated from uh, either layer 4B or layer six. Uh, and we don't know to this day, really, which ones are giving rise to which axons. All I can say is of the ones that we have uh, reconstructed in uh, MTV5, uh, they all have had arbors in, in uh, both layer four and layer six. Now, let me use the slide <coughs> to make my main point, and that is if you have spatially distributed arbors in, uh, and this is one millimeter removed dorsal ventral, um, it is, it's almost obligatory that they are contacting a different proportion of postsynaptic neurons. The neurons will be some assortment of pyramidal and interneurons, mainly pyramidal neurons. Uh, but what are the numbers? You could guess a little bit by counting the boutons, and the boutons are going to be small numbers in the hundreds. Um, the uh, proportion is probably uh, of Exact pyramidal neurons and the interneurons will be different, and that's particularly true in MT, where you have this layer six and layer four. So here I had gone very quickly over the issue of uh, who, are, is the, who are the postsynaptic neurons here and what is happening through those multiple arbors when there is a passage of, of information. Is it exactly the same in the, the two or three loci? Uh, is it different? Is there plasticity here? And uh, those are, rather than say unknown questions, I'm going to stress uh, open questions that probably will be more addressable uh, as we apply some of the rodent techniques to, to, um, to macaque, or uh, as Nikos was alluding to, use some of the connectivity uh, methods in fMRI imaging. <clears throat> now I've come back to this. A comparison, I, I told you the conventions, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, here, uh, I'm showing you V1 to V2 axons, uh, a set of six, and V2 to V4. If you're not used to looking at these uh, maps, uh, it can be a, con a bit confusing, but uh, let me see. Uh, okay, this is the easiest one to follow. Here is the injection site, main axon followed across 
the, uh, the lunate sulcus, the white matter, to what is a single arbor. And I said the size is around uh, 250 to 400 microns. So this might make uh, sense when you start thinking of cortical-cortical connections, that you have one, uh, one loci. Uh, the same thing here, one arbor. But this is a group of, of four axons that were converging in the same, uh, same place uh, with one uh, or three or diffuse arbors. Now, the interpretation of this would be very easy if we knew the parent neurons. We don't. We just we don't know if they're adjacent to each other, uh, if they're separated by 50 microns, 50 microns, 50 microns. And it also would be uh, very nice if we knew how these related to the uh, cytochrome oxidase compartments that we heard about yesterday. Uh, in principle, that is easy, uh, maybe easier these days than it was when we started this. But combined techniques, especially here, since you have to do serial, a serial section, uh, has its own challenges. You need to compromise you looking at one or another. So we don't know how these axons are related to the functional architecture. What we do know is that from one injection site, four neurons, uh, and these would be presumably in layer three of V1, are contacting their target area in very different ways. <clears throat> Now, uh, I think I skip here. Um, we had looked at only a few, no, few areas. They seemed like a lot at the time, but they're relatively few. V1 to V2, V1 to MT, V2 to V4. Uh, looking at variability, uh, not animal to animal or within animal or state dependent, but uh, simply is there area, are there area differences? And, as best we could tell with a small number of, of uh, a sample size, uh, we felt that the arbor size did not get significantly larger from area to area. It's variable, but uh, if I gave you a figure, I would say 250 to 400 microns. But the number of arbors uh, seemed to increase. Uh, certainly in, in V2 to V4, uh, there was easily three to four arbors, and that was pretty reliable. It was rare to see one arbor, whereas in a V1 to V2, although you could see three arbors, three spatially, <coughs> spatially dispersed arbors, uh, at least 50% of them were uh, a single arbor. So this would be uh, consistent with the idea of a generally retinotopic organization, uh, although the other larger arbors Again, something different would be going on. Uh, so this repeats now, maybe is a bit more familiar, having spent a few minutes on the other. Um, here are the layer four, and that's what we always stress, V1 to MTV5 and layer four, but very consistently this layer six. And at least in the occipital areas, the layer six termination is consistent with this field, uh, but no others in the feed-forward direction. Now, in thinking about this, I don't know if I succeeded in sharing my view of the spatial, what might be going on in space, and that it's a little bit um, strange, or at least not, uh, not simply consistent with a single retinotopic <coughs> projection. Now, uh, that reminds me, and I'm going to diverge for two slides, uh, we've been looking at one area to another, uh, but this is work from recent work uh, using barcoding from uh, Tony Zader's lab in the mouse, where they were looking from one area extrinsic uh, to several others. And in that case, what struck me was we had for a long time, I think, been used to considering <coughs> uh, V1 to... Uh, a number of separate extra striate areas. Uh, and they, in fact, found that. This was work done by two techniques. One, hand reconstruction, just as I had been showing you. But, uh, can, and that's the uh, 30 reconstructions. And then the barcoding uh, map seek, where you don't know the individual neuron, but you can analyze uh, who, who originated from where. When they do that, uh, Okay, here is the, is the bottom line in, in the map. Uh, 
23% of the V1 neurons went to one particular area, but the others are bifurcated to uh, one, two, three, four, five, or, or up to seven areas. So this principle, and they call that dedicated or um, or broadcast. And I'm wondering, um, not hypothesizing, but wondering if that is a little bit what is going on uh, with these multiple arbors from here, V2 to V4. Uh, perhaps you have uh, the principal arbor, because one is always seems larger in terms of size and number of boutons that would be equivalent to driving, if you will, or to um, a dedicated, more important arbor, whereas the others are secondary. Now, what might be going on in terms of dynamics and function with a dedicated uh, or um, principal and secondary um, is something that I really don't know and certainly would appreciate discussion. The uh, continued diverging, uh, so I showed you single axon examples of feed forward and their spatial distribution. Now, the a related idea is uh, a bit taken from the, from the uh, Han work, is uh, what happens to by collateralization to other areas. And just as they were showing in the, uh, in the mouse, uh, it's been actually known for a long time that a proportion of neurons in any given projection will branch uh, to other areas. Uh, so that was reported uh, for feedback, which we'll go to very soon, of uh, a rather high percentage of TEO neurons also projecting to V4. And uh, in particular, uh, neurons in the deeper layers, the Meinert cells in V1, uh, projecting not just to MTV5, uh, but to other areas as well. <clears throat> Uh, we saw uh, branching to the colliculus uh, from MT and the colliculus. It was reported MT and superior, superior colliculus. Excuse me. And uh, in fact, the, the summary from the retrograde tracing in the marmoset was all combinations were found. So both in terms of one area projecting to another, one area projecting out, there is a motif of... Uh, spatial uh, divergence. Uh, and that is, sh is shown especially in the association areas. This is from colleagues in Japan, the Tanaka group, who uh, did heroic reconstruction, as I think you can see. Injection here is in, uh, is in the parahippocampal area. And the key here is that there are six arbors widely dispersed uh, along the uh, parahippocampal gyrus and then into a completely different structure, namely the amygdala, where you have uh, their arbor five, arbor six. The boutons that they're showing, uh, the number of boutons, which is at least as important as the size and probably more important, uh, seem very small. Uh, so a question that you're bound to ask is, well, what do we know, uh, can we be sure that there is complete filling? And especially when there are, I think the branching is very well uh, well shown with high level of confidence, number of boutons perhaps um, a little less so. So it'd be nice to have a repeat of this. <clears throat> now, going very quickly, I've talked about uh, space, about collateralization and divergence. I want to, sh to uh, share with you a slide, um, which uh, the only slide that I'll put in with convergence, um, because it was sort of a, a, um, a lucky slide and certainly changed a little bit my thinking. So, uh, again, the patches, uh, these are patches and cortex shown by autoradiography many years ago. Um, this was Pat Goldman Rakish with colossal connections in the monkey. Um, Samir was also seeing this in different system. We were, but John Koss, many people. And um, it was very, very exciting. Now, I was... Fortunate in, in one uh, animal, <clears throat> we had injected parahippocampal. Uh, we're actually looking more at local areas, but um, I happened to scan uh, a little bit further and noticed that there was projection to uh, 
the parietal region, which was, was not particularly surprising in itself. It was a very nicely organized, uh, what looked like a column here. And uh, it looked feasible and approachable to, <coughs> to analyze, to microdissect, which we set out to do. And it looked for a while that we had, I think it is again, six arbors, uh, all slightly different in terms of size. The layers, and this is my emphasis here, the layers <coughs> that they were uh, contacting, and the number of lutons, the numbers are given here. And then we tried usually, uh, in this case as well, to reconstruct as far back in the white matter as usual, which was often not very far, and uh, not shown. Uh, this looks as if it's two axons, it's not. They actually joined uh, deeper in the white matter. So the uh, <coughs> conclusion here is one axon can branch to what looks like two column, columns, especially here, and those columns will be made up of multiple arbors of one axon. They are not identical, but are hitting uh, layers in different combinations. Uh, for me, the, the key here is, again, different combinations, whether it's in space or, or vertical. So, uh, let me show you another example of that. I told you this is a survey, a little bit jumpy. Uh, so, I'm moving now to uh, one slide on the pulvinar projecting to a V2. The, uh, so this is a small anatomy lesson, this is a coronal section of the pulvinar. The injection was in the lateral pulvinar, uh, which probably does not receive retinal connections. Uh, the inferior pulvinar, it, it's, I think, not so clear in the monkey whether it does or not. Uh, PL doesn't, and PM is association. So, again, we, uh, <clears throat> we were able to uh, label and analyze 25 uh, uh, axons in B2. Here, uh, as you would see with, the, with bulk injections, the targ main target layer is layer 4, but if you do single axon reconstruction, here is the main axon entering the white matter, uh, it extends, it's, it is divergent, and it's not just layer 4, uh, but also a little bit layer 1 and the deeper layers as well, and that was consistent across uh, axons in V2. We never found one axon that was going just to uh, layer 4. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, a larger sample size was provided uh, by Fr Francisco Klaska in, <clears throat> in the rodent uh, using Synbis virus, which at low titer will give you a uh, Golgi-like filling. And on the basis of that, he distinguished uh, four types of uh, thalamocortical axons, and I'm only going to emphasize this one, uh, what he called multi-specific thalamocortical. Here's the thal thalamic neuron, and you see he's using our area AB, but that's okay, uh, terminating in multiple cortical areas in different laminar organization. Not stereotype, but different uh, la laminar combination, and I, I chose his quote here. Uh, since the axonal arborization then may target different layers in the various areas, contacting different elements of the local circuits, which is the theme I've been repeating again and again without giving you details because I don't know them. The same input may be computed in parallel but in different complementary ways in the various areas. And of course, we would love to know what are those different complementary ways. So to summarize uh, what I've said so far, the, uh, a typical feedback axon, with the exception of V1 to V2, in the, ox in the occipital lobe will have relatively um, compact arbors, uh, which will be spatially separate, uh, and in terms of uh, vary, in terms of bouton number, and presumably you have to fill in yourself the composition of the postsynaptic uh, uh, assemblies and what those postsynaptic uh, post assemblies may be doing. They themselves, as I'll come back to at the very end, are potentially linked by intrinsic connections. So uh, the dyad, or the, <clears throat> the two-way, is not necessarily just feed-forward, feedback, but you also have feed-forward intrinsic, and you have feedback neurons and intrinsic, intrinsic collaterals. Now, the uh, feedback neurons, 
have also have spatial uh, characteristics, and they're very different than the uh, feed-forward. Uh, just a few words on the feedback neurons. Uh, they originate, as, as we've known for a long time, many groups in different layers, not layer three, but uh, layer six, and often a little bit layer two and three A. Um, the axon uh, caliber, uh, Kevin Martin, has analyzed uh, some of these feedback connections from V2 to V1, and uh, and distinguish several subcategories on the basis of axon um, caliber and degree of myelination. And what I'll be uh, continuing to stress here, uh, they are uh, also divergent, and I don't know if they're divergent within class. In the first paper, we, we uh, identified some neurons, some terminations that seem discrete. Uh, since then, most of the feedback axons that I've handled myself are very divergent, as I'm showing here in, in layer one. Um, just one more thing on a distinction of feedback neuron types. The heterogeneity um, is something that we still need to investigate, as I re refer to the RNA-seq. Uh, but an interesting other marker is, is some neurons in, in layer 6, especially in B2 and B4, uh, use synaptic zinc, uh, not the neurons in layer 2, in layer two 3, but in layer six, and not all the neurons in layer six, zinc is an activity-related marker um, that re interacts with many receptors, including the uh, GABA-A, NMDA. Uh, the mossy fibers in the hippocampus are the most zinc-enriched system. Um, it's not necessarily what feedback neurons are doing, and this was shown by uh, retrograde tracing with, with sodium selenate. Now, going back to the... Uh, Spatial organization, I think I hit twice, okay. Uh, I just said that they are very divergent, and I'm showing you uh, extreme examples, but they're very, very typical and easily re uh, robust and re replicatable. Uh, this is V4 to V1, two examples. Again, here is your main axon entering the, uh, the gray matter and diverging, okay, I put it someplace, but over millimeter distance. The same thing here, V4 to V1, and sometimes even going uh, from V1 to into V2. Another thing that's very obvious with this axon is you have a what looks like a hybrid geometry. So there's a, a set of uh, linear, small linear portions in layer one, and then a cluster. And again, uh, I don't know if, if Kevin will come back to this, but this reminds me very much of one of his intrinsic uh, collaterals, which had both linear and clustered, uh, clustered geometry. So this, again, if you, if you fit in what must be going on with the postsynaptic assemblage, you have a, a line of apical dendrites, beam-like, almost uh, cerebellar-like, and then a cluster of neurons that is somehow is being selected. And this is in the squirrel monkey, MTV5, going over uh, a vast 3.6 millimeter uh, anterior posterior extent. There tend to be more boutons. Not only are these neurons, the feedback, more divergent, but they also have uh, almost an order of magnitude more boutons than the uh, feed forward. So the, uh, I'm really saying nothing direct about circuitry at all, but uh, you can infer that in this case you have uh, differences in the um, apical dendrite versus the uh, other parts of the, of the dendrite. Uh, and the number of postsynaptic targets and their arrangement, beam-like or clustered. Uh, the, uh, I'm diverging a little bit, but I wanted to give you another example of feedback. This is uh, a, the same animal we saw, uh, injection in the ventral temporal area, and in this case, um, projection into interparietal sulcus not the, uh, the lobule, but the sulcus. And the uh, same theme of very divergent, these were almost, uh, of all the axons that I, I have worked with and, and analyzed, uh, these are the only two that have struck me as being at all similar. <laughs> the difference being perhaps MT, where the layer six was a recurring and consistent theme. Uh, but 
here, I, I don't know whether we would characterize these as feedback or as uh, associational, probably feedback. Uh, and notice that in this region, the, the more proximal region, uh, you have a, a bilaminar layer six and the upper layers. As the um, axon continues divergently, uh, the deeper layer uh, falls out and you have only the distance. Now, uh, that could be either because we're in two different uh, parietal areas in the interparietal sulcus, or uh, because of uh, a very that the, the, ax, the neuron and the axon want to contact uh, these assemblages within that space in a very different different way. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details here. One advantage of uh, axon reconstruction is you can get very good quantitative uh, morphological data. Uh, the simple thing here, and I want to stay in, in broad brushstrokes, the uh, feedback, feed forward here uh, to MT, small number of boutons, and it's only when you go to the uh, reverse direction in the feedback that you more consistently get um, 1,000, 2,000 neurons. So very different, uh, yes, area A projects to area B and back, but in very different spatial and uh, quantitative parameters. The, almost the last uh, part that I want to go into again is the relationship, and this relationship between the extrinsic projections and the intrinsic collaterals. So here we're back looking at V1 to, uh, to MTV5, uh, layer four and layer six, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the neurons of origin are either, as I said, 4B or layer six, and we don't really know the exact relationship of the, the intrinsic and extrinsic collaterals. But uh, here, as an exaggeration, perhaps exaggeration, but it may be true, uh, I'm assuming that this might be from originating from a, a minor cell in layer six. If so, the intrinsic collateral is going to be even more divergent, uh, widely divergent, uh, with a large, uh, in this case, not such a large number of boutons. Uh, but here's your comparison with the, um, excuse me, with the intrinsic. Uh, I think the, the, extra, the intrinsic collateral is likely, as a rule, to be larger than the uh, extrinsic, at least with feed forward. So here is a schematic of what I think is going on uh, for V1 to V2, V2 to V4 in particular. Extrinsic, uh, rather small, compact, uh, one, two, or three arbors uh, over space, but, but uh, still discrete. The intrinsic arbor within the layer, within V1, is very, very widespread. And uh, the, if you allow for the uh, indirect effects or second order connectivity, then the, this neuron's neighbors projecting to the same region are going to be reinforced by recurrent collaterals um, for uh, basic processes. The, Feedback connections, uh, you have almost a reverse, I don't want to stress this too much, but you have what looks like a reverse complementarity where the uh, extrinsic is more typically divergent, not uh, compact. And uh, we probably know less about the intrinsic arbor here, but I'm taking from uh, an assortment of data, Alex, Alex Thompson, and, and guessing that the uh, intrinsic might be rather limited in layer six. So. Uh, restricted, divergent, divergent, restricted. And that pattern also holds in a, another system uh, that I just alluded to with the uh, thalamocortical, uh, where, and I'm sorry to introduce this so quickly, but uh, the uh, thalamocortical, uh, one has two very distinct classes, uh, origin, one has compact uh, arbor, and that's all I want to leave you with. And the intrinsic collateral is likely to be very divergent, whereas the second class has very divergent arbor in the pulvinar and is likely to have a very uh, restricted intrinsic collateral. So the cortex may be playing what I'll call games, but it's obviously a very uh, important and I think basic uh, game here. So now I think I...
Uh, my, I will defer to, to Kevin if he's going to mention intrinsic collaterals, as I would assume. Uh, but the point I will pull is that the uh, intrinsic collaterals themselves, this is one neuron uh, coronal section in, um, in cat V1. This now is looking down on uh, what he and, and Rodney called the uh, daisy uh, configuration. And uh, here with multiple collaterals, how many collaterals are there? And, but they are very morphologically distinct. Okay, so I said with cortical architectures, and now in my last minute, uh, plus or minus, um, I will at least flash slides here of what are, is the cortical architecture, and of course, uh, it's, uh, this would be another talk, really, in terms of what are columns, what are the different sizes of columns. Uh, for our purposes of extrinsic collaterals, one is inclined to think of what's called macro column, which would be like an ocular dominance column. They're also um, mini columns. And the, uh, the point here, I, I can't really make it in such a short time, but you have multiple spatial scales. So layer six in some animals and some regions has what looks like a micromodularity. Layer two in some regions, a pronounced micromodularity. And the reason I'm bring, putting this in is not to start a second talk, but to urge you to think of those spatial overlay, those spatial patterns of axons onto this type of, of uh, complex multi-scale uh, modular organization. So what I have con concluded, there are two very quick concluding slides. This is what I showed you, uh, feed, a very nice feed example of feed forward with a layer six, pulvinal cortical, multiple layers, multiple layers here, but not so much as here, feedback multiple layers, and how are these, what are they doing in space? I would have loved to have told you. I, may do one aspect of this in continued work, uh, which will address postsynaptic uh, targets, if not the assemblage. Uh, but I think you can, you can yourself list a whole set of questions that would come from the spatial organization of each projection and how it relates uh, together. So the um, more open questions rather than conclusions, I'll come back to this issue of nomenclature. We have to get beyond the arrows and beyond the uh, uh, pairwise, very few things are really pairwise connections, it's, it's all divergent. Uh, whole neuron is good, uh, what are the intrinsic and extrinsic collaterals together? Quantitative, uh, this is what I've been saying again and again, very frustratingly not telling you very much, uh, but I hope you can uh, continue to think about that. Certainly the dynamics, uh, and then uh, a little bit easier probably, given resources, the area and species characterizations. And just as a last slide, I'm again, um, forget the canonical circuits, really what I'm talking about is, is canonical uh, columns or canonical entities. This is, is too strong a uh, formulation. But to set up a straw man, perhaps, I mean, when we, if you think of repetitive organization, what could be more repetitive than the omatidium of a horseshoe crab eye? Or uh, honey comp complex retina. Uh, and I don't think, maybe, uh, probably no one thinks that the cortex is actually like that. Uh, it may be much more like a forest uh, where you have an interacting uh, environment. This was from a National Geographic of how trees talk to each other by uh, not just root communication, but various communications. So uh, I hope, uh, there's also a pun here, I hope that I haven't given you too much uh, the trees for the forest or the forest for the trees. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. We have time for very few questions. Okay. Too many trees. <laughs> Could the larger extent of the feedback connections from V4 to V1 be related to the difference in receptive field size? Well, there's very little I can say no to. Uh, 
uh, the, I mean, you tend to see this again and, and again. So I'm not really so committed myself to the receptive to fields, but you also have to think of layer six in relation to the, those layer one targets. Um, so for me, the easier thing is just, just calculating the numbers and the size. But you're right to say, I mean, it is, it is possible. The reason I hesitated, though, was because um, the injections in the ventral temporal areas, but then again, you would have the same uh, possibility that it is somehow carving out its own uh, topography or so, even if it's a center and a surround type thing. Are the multi-specific projections organized in a manner that within one era there's the same type of projections, or do they even differ within, uh, within one, one particular era? Uh, well, what do you mean by differ? If it's one arbor and multiple arbors, yes. In the layer, for instance, are constant within one cortical era, or are these variations in a manner that even two collaterals, for instance, end up in, say, layer two, three, one of them, or layer four, the other? Well, for sure. When I said, uh, and I would agree with you completely, uh, again, it's, it's language gets in the way. You say originate from layer three, <laughs> but layer three is not a monolayer. It's, 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 it's quite wide. Uh, and if you're a neuron at the top of layer three, are you the same neuron as at the bottom? You're in a very different connectional environment. Uh, and how does that play out? Uh, you also can be very different in terms of your neighbors. I think the, mm. I found myself following the, um, uh, Nick Spruce, uh, Spruceton's work in the subiculum. I think the, right now the rodent hippocampus is, is really quite interesting in terms of the clustering that they're coming up with in relation to the connectivity in genetics and the, and the clustering. So the key here, if, if we had the, uh, the resources, would be, and that's why I put it in open questions, um, it doesn't help with dynamics, but it helps in terms of, of mapping if you have a whole neuron visualization. So if you could stick a neuron anyway with juxtacellular or intracellular virus. Or, um, and, then, uh, and then if you have enough sample size, <laughs> you can start uh, uh, understanding and going the, the next step. The next step, I think, um, that already is very basic, though, to be honest. But the next step would be, well, what happens at these different loci and what happens with the stratification in layer three, in layer six also. It's not, not a monolayer, it's, it's wider. Thank you very much.